Maxwell's equations, the constitutive relations. The constitutive relations are deceptively simple. They look like simple equations, but I think by the end of this video, you will see they're actually the most complicated of the equations. They're much more involved than Maxwell's equations, and they involve a lot more physics. And getting a deep understanding of the constitutive relations will give you a much deeper understanding of electromagnetics. So we will talk about the electric responsive materials, the magnetic responsive materials, and then also talk about how to classify different materials just from how they manifest themselves in the constitutive relations. So we start with the electric responsive materials. And remember back when we talked about the terms and definitions, we saw that there's really two different ways to, for electric energy to manifest itself. We can have electric energy in outer space and we can have electric energy stored in matter. And then we said there's this term called the electric susceptibility. This is essentially how easy it is for a material to, or the charges in that material to displace. And so we apply an electric field to a material based on its susceptibility or how easy it is to displace charge, we get some kind of polarization, material polarization. So we start with the basic relation between the material polarization and the electric field, and it's related through the susceptibility. Now, an interesting things happen here. As we apply an electric field, that electron cloud displaces, and this is very much like the displacement of a mass on a spring. As long as we're only pulling on that spring rather gently, there's a linear relationship between displacement and the force that you're applying to that. That's called Hooke's Law. However, we also know if you pull on that spring very, very hard, that that displacement force relationship becomes nonlinear. And the same thing happens here. If the electric field is intense enough, the displacement of those clouds is no longer a linear relation. So what we do in this case is just write the relation of polarization and electric field as a polynomial. And we'll call these different terms chi1, chi2, chi3. And we would recognize that the chi1 term, normally just called the electric susceptibility, that's responsible for the linear responsive materials. And in this class, that's what we'll deal with. We won't work with nonlinear materials in this class. And that's a little bit unfortunate because there's a lot of really cool things that happen with those higher order terms. So those higher order terms are responsible for the nonlinear responsive materials. So there's actually more than one electric susceptibility term. Unfortunately, in this class, we're going to ignore the nonlinear responsive materials. So here we are where we bring together the two forms of electric energy. We have the electric field that can exist in vacuum, and we have the electric energy that can exist in matter. And the electric flux density is the all-inclusive term that included both. Well, we also saw that for linear materials, the material polarization, the electric polarization, is the electric field times the electric susceptibility and also times the free space permittivity. Now we have some common terms here that we can factor out. We'll put the free space permittivity on the left and the electric field on the right, and we're left with this 1 plus chi 1 term. We can also write our constitutive relation that relates D to E through the permittivity. And these two equations must be telling us the same thing. And so the terms that are different, in this equation, we have the relative permittivity or the dielectric constant. And over here, we have the 1 plus chi 1. So in fact, those two things must be equal. The permittivity is a measure of how well a medium stores electric energy. And that has to include both the vacuum response and the response of the dielectric itself. So we can repeat the exact same story for the magnetic fields. Remember, there's two ways to have magnetic energy. We can have magnetic energy in the vacuum of space. We can also have magnetic energy stored in matter.
and the magnetic flux density B, this is the all-inclusive term that includes both. And also remember that we have this magnetic susceptibility that tells us how easy it is to align the magnetic dipoles at the molecular scale. So if we apply a magnetic field H, that gives us some magnetization through this proportionality constant, the magnetic susceptibility. Well, the magnetization of the material, that can also be nonlinear. And we can write the relation between M and H, expand into a polynomial. This first term, which is what we've been talking about, is the linear response. But we have all these other terms that would describe the nonlinear magnetic response. And we would still call this a chi-2 and a chi-3 type of term. So we have multiple magnetic susceptibilities as well. Lots of cool behavior here. And unfortunately, in this class, we will focus on just the linear response of materials. And like before, we can write our constitutive relation just in terms of the permeability, or we can write it in terms of the magnetic susceptibility. And we can compare the two and see that our relative permeability is one plus the magnetic susceptibility, where the one is the vacuum response and the chi term is the magnetic response due to having matter. Some materials are anisotropic. Let's go back to this picture where we apply a field and those electron clouds displace. Well, in some molecules and in some lattices, just because of how they are constructed, the charges can be displaced in some directions more easily than others. So if we push on those charges with an electric field E, but they displace in a different direction, that means the electric flux density D will actually be in a different direction than the electric field intensity E. And that is anisotropy. And the analogy I like to use, imagine you're pushing on a sliding glass door, but you're pushing on it at a 45 degree angle. So you're pushing it to the side, but also trying to push it straight. Well, that sliding glass door does not displace straight because it's on its rails. It only displaces to the side. So even though you're pushing on it with a component straight in, it only displaces to the side. So things display sometimes in directions different than how you're pushing on it. We can look at the permittivity tensor. This is what arises when things are anisotropic. And we can think of a tensor as a generalization to a scalar. If we take a vector and multiply it by a scalar number, we just change the magnitude of that vector. Well, if we can change the magnitude and direction of a vector, we call it a tensor. And so our permittivity then becomes a tensor to allow the D field to be in a different direction than the E field. Also notice I'm not putting X, Y, Z here for the subscripts. I'm using A, B, and C. And that's because anisotropy arises in crystals where the crystals have axes, natural axes, that are sometimes different than X, Y, Z. So we just write that as A, B, C. So when we express our tensor in the directions of A, B, C, but the numbers down the diagonal are all the same, we call this an isotropic media. And in fact, we don't have to write the permittivity as a tensor in this case. It's just a constant. And isotropic materials is what we'll study in this class. And again, that's a little bit unfortunate because some cool things happen when things are anisotropic. We also have the case where in two directions, the permittivity is one value, and in a third direction, it's something else altogether. The two directions that are similar, we call the ordinary permittivity, and the one that is different, we call the extraordinary permittivity. And even more, we can look at the difference between the ordinary and extraordinary permittivity. We'll call that the birefringence, or we could think of it as the strength of the anisotropy. And that could be a positive number that we call positive birefringence, or a negative number we call it negative birefringence. So that's called a uniaxial medium.
And then in the most general setting, all three numbers are different. And we call that a biaxial medium. And the convention is to put the smallest number in the first position, the middle number in the second position, and then the largest number in the last position. And we call that a biaxial medium. Now we might wonder, we're having zeros here. What happens, how do we get numbers in these off diagonal positions? And so here's the short story. We live in a three-dimensional world. We can only push charges in three dimensions. So really there's only ever just three permittivity terms. But we get numbers in these off diagonal terms when we're analyzing the crystal in an axis system that is not A, B, and C. We might rotate or use a different coordinate system altogether. And then information from these three center numbers start to leak out into the off diagonals. So we're only free to choose three numbers describing our permittivity. And we simply get the off diagonal terms when we're analyzing an anisotropic medium in a coordinate system different than its natural axes. A lot more to that story, and I think I did a pretty bad job of explaining that, but uh, that's why those zeros are there and how we would get numbers other than zero there. When a material is anisotropic in both permittivity and permeability, we call that doubly anisotropic. We can have materials that are chiral. So at the molecular level, there's, there's spirals somehow. And we can have gyroelectric materials, gyromagnetic materials, and these types of materials tend to rotate the polarization of a wave. We can classify materials as either ordinary or biisotropic and bianisotropic. And in fact, it forms this nice little quad chart. So ordinary materials, we're writing the constitutive relations, how we will study them in this class. So it's an ordinary material, it's an isotropic medium, and we just have our, our two simple constitutive relations. Well, if those materials are anisotropic, then the permittivity and permeability become tensors, and we write square brackets around them. Well, it turns out more can happen. In fact, there's cases where if we apply an electric field, that will directly induce a magnetic field and the other way around, in which case we have to modify our constitutive relations. And so we would call this a bi-isotropic material. And this term here is called the magnetoelectric coupling coefficient. Notice it's the same term in these two positions. Then of course, our magnetoelectric coupling coefficient, the permittivity and permeability could also be tensors. And we call this a bi-anisotropic medium. Notice these two tensors are the same. There's a transpose operation, but the magnetoelectric tensor is the same in both constitutive relations other than that transpose. Uh, lots of cool stuff that happens here. And in this class, we're doing the simple, ordinary, isotropic constitutive relations. But I do want to point you to that there's a lot more out there.